Hello everyone, I'm Sheena and welcome to my channel Comprehend Biotech. We are learning RNA-seq and this is part 4 of the video series. This video series is specifically designed for undergrad students, so the content is described in a very simple manner and it will aid in their coursework. So I really hope this helps you. If it does, please do share your valuable feedback in the comment section. RNA-seq has majorly four steps, out of which the first three steps have been covered in the part one, two, and three. They were RNA isolation, cDNA library preparation, and next generation sequencing. Step four in RNA sequencing is data analysis. So let's see what and all we'll be covering today. So today, under data analysis, we'll be looking at data processing or data pre-processing. After that, about transcriptome assembly. Then we'll be looking what could be the different end goals for our experiment. Then we'll have a summary of the complete RNA-seq procedure. Also, in the end, we'll be briefly looking at the current technologies of direct RNA sequencing and single-cell RNA sequencing. Now, in this particular session, you might not find the actual bioinformatics part that how a software is run, what are the commands that you give. Those things might not be here, but a general overview of how the data is analyzed once you get it out of the sequencer will be there. To save your time, kindly do go through the description of this video and you will see the timestamp for the different topics we'll be discussing in this particular session. Okay, so let's start. <music> Welcome again. So let us see what happens in data analysis. Data analysis basically will be carrying out data processing or data pre-processing, the assembly, and then the analysis. Okay. So the data that you get after sequencing, it's just not raw ATCG like that. Okay. You get it in something called fast Q format. This is how a fast Q format looks like. So let us see what are the components present in that file format okay so the line one that you see in this yellow color right so your line one begins with this character and is followed by a sequence identifier so this is the sequence id but whatever it is it will be written over there and an optional description like a faster title line so that would be there the line two is the raw sequence letter so this is the actual sequence in what order your nucleotides are okay and this will be your read length also so line three begins with a plus character you can see over here and is optionally followed by the same sequence identifier and any other description again. Line four encodes the quality values for the sequence in line two and must contain the same number of symbols as letters in the sequence. So what are they trying to say? Line four actually gives you the quality. Okay, how sure is your software or how sure is your sequencer that this particular base was the one exactly in your DNA? Okay, in part three of this video series, we looked at sequencing and how next generation sequencing is done. What did we see there? As and when a base is being added, an image is captured and your software actually does something called base calling. Base calling is nothing but it assi assigns a particular base to a particular color that we have got after imaging, right? So that is called base calling. Now, how sure or unsure this particular software is about whether it has done the base calling properly or not is denoted by something called the FRED score. So that is what is being shown over here. Now, these FRED scores, which look uh, like different symbols, are nothing but your American Standard Code for Information Interchange, or ASCII. So it is a character encoding standard for electronic communication. So all these symbols that you see over here, these are in increasing order. So your exclamatory mark will be having the lowest score, and your the symbol right over here will be having the highest score. So based on how sure or unsure the software is, each uh, nucleotide that you have the raw sequence will be given a score. So the higher the score, the better the probability that this particular uh, nucleotide was actually added in, during the sequencing. Okay. So what will we be doing in this data pre-processing or data processing, right? First of all, we'll be demultiplexing by index or barcode. So if you remember, NGS is a high throughput sequencing method, right? And you could pool in different samples together by using a technique called multiplex. In multiplexing, what you did, you assigned a particular tag or barcode or index to a particular uh, sequence. And when you see that particular index in that particular fragment, you know it be uh, belongs to a specific experiment. So this pooling in together is called multiplexing. So at the end of your sequencing, you need to do demultiplexing. That is, you have numerous reads. Now you need to uh, categorize which read belongs to which experiment. That is called demultiplexing. So the first step in data processing would be to actually demultiplex, to assign each read to 
each sample from each experiment. Okay. Next would be to remove adapter sequences. So sometimes your read, right? Your the read read is the number of nucleotides that has been sequenced by your sequencer. Those could also include sequences from your adapters, right? So you need to remove those from your actual reads in order to go for the actual sequence assembly. So you have to remove the adapter sequences in those cases. Also, you need to trim or discard reads by quality. So that depends on your base calling or FRED score that we discussed earlier. What you need to understand is your actual strand is attached to the adapter on the flow cell with its 5 dash end, right? And 3 dash end is free at the top. And that is where your primer comes in as and the sequencing begins. So the new strand that is synthesized is in the 5 dash to 3 dash direction. As and when the sequencing proceeds, the because of sophistications in the sequencing procedure, towards the three dash end of the new strand, the base calling or the quality, the FRED score becomes really low. So in case you find that your FRED score is becoming lower towards the three dash end, you need to trim those ends, okay, to get a good read. Then we need to do something called normalizing our data. Okay, we'll be looking at what that is. So FastX Toolkit, Gobi, Stacks, Biopieces are examples of reprocessing softwares. So these are the ones that carry out all these steps before we actually go into sequence assembly. Now, there are a few concepts that we need to understand before we go further, right? One is something called sequencing depth or coverage. So we have already sequenced our DNA fragment or cDNA fragment. So technically, coverage refers to the number of reads being sequenced in relation to the genome size. That is, it is an estimate of how many times each base of the genome is sequenced. So in this figure, if you see over here, this is read 1, read 2, read 3, read 4. If you look at this, this is one read, right, of read length 18, suppose. This particular base has been covered four times using these four reads. So that is the depth for this specific base. If you look at this base over here, these reads are covering it three times. So that is the depth of this read. Okay, so that is what is meant by coverage. Now, since coverage or depth is in reference or in relation to the genome size, in RNA-seq, it's of very little practical value because transcriptome is something that is derived from the genome. And we do not know the actual size of the transcriptome as, as much as we know about the gene. So more importantly, the per base coverage will vary drastically between different transcripts depending on their expression. So when we're talking about transcripts, how many number of transcripts are there? It will depend on how much the gene has been expressed or how less the gene has been expressed. So if you have more gene expression, you will have more number of transcript and more coverage. So you, you cannot uh, assign a depth or coverage based on the transcriptome, okay? So therefore, the total number of reads generated in a single experiment is typically normalized by converting counts into fragments, reads, or counts per million mapped reads. So these are called FPM, RPM, or CPM, okay? So sequencing depth is sometimes referred to as library size, the number of intermediary cDNA molecules in the experiment. So here, uh, sequencing depth is actually, you're referring to your cDNA molecules, or it is called the library size, okay? Now the number of counts or the coverage or the sequence depth in case of RNA-seq will also depend on something else. It will depend on the gene length. So longer genes will have more fragments, reads or counts than shorter genes if transcript expression is the same. This is adjusted by dividing the fragment per million reads by the length of the gene, resulting in the metric fragments per kilobase of transcript per million map reads. That is something called FPKM. Okay. So you have something called fragments per million map reads. Okay. And you divide it by the fragment length. So that will give you something called FPKM or fragments per kilobase of transcripts per million map reads. Okay. So when looking at groups of genes across samples, FPKM is converted to transcripts per million. TPM by dividing each FPKM by the sum of FPKMs within a sample. So here in this session, I'm actually just giving you a peek into these terms. And as a beginner, you need to understand that these terms are the ones which are being used in RNA-seq. Okay. So if you see over here, gene A is there and gene B is there. Suppose their expression level is the same, right? After expression, uh, this mRNA will be fra fragmented and you will have gene A is 1KB. You will have, say, five reads for it. If gene B is 2KB, more long, you will have more number of reads for it. So this does not mean that gene B is expressing more than gene A. 
so you just cannot simply take the read count as the uh, as the basis for your expression levels right so th that is why you need to go for such normalizations so after normalizations you will have the, the actual count of gene a and gene b so after you have done your data processing the next step is mapping and assembly so in order to identify the transcripts that are present in a specific sample the genomic origin of the sequence cdna fragments must be determined right so the assignment of sequence reads to the most likely locus of origin is called mapping and it is a crucial step in almost all high throughput sequencing experiments so basically we are trying to find out where our sequence is on the chromosome you're going trying to find out the locus of origin okay you have your mrna it has been transcribed to cdna and that is what you have sequenced so that will be mapped back in order to understand where its location is exactly okay now you might have learned about dna sequencing you might have learned about how they are mapped and how the assembly is done but in rna seq the major challenge is you have something called exon exon spanning reads right? If you look at your normal genome and you look at your cDNA, there is a major difference that the introns are removed. There are no introns in your cDNA. So when you try to map together these uh, cDNA molecules, right, there will be always a gap. Wherever the intron was there, there will always be a gap, right? So to read or to find overlapping sequences across these gaps is a major challenge in RNA seq. Okay. So one approach to resolving this problem is to supplement the reference genome with sequences derived from exon exon splice junctions acquired from known gene annotations so if you have certain exon exon splice junctions so those are the splice junctions right between two exons when the intron is removed that is the splice junction so if you have information about that from different genomes that can be used in order to uh, aid in the mapping process of a newly sequenced cdna so this is the problem that is being told over here now this is your pre mrna it will have your introns as well as exons this black color ones are introns these are exons so once you have your mrna that is a processed r mrna you will ha not have these introns these introns are removed so that is called splicing right so you will have something like this without any introns and you are sequencing this mrna right you're converting or transcribing it reverse transcribing it to cdna and then you're taking the reads for this particular cdna so the reads that you have are short reads that you get from ngs and we discussed why these are short reads in the previous part right and this short read is split by intron when aligning to the reference genome so the reference genome will be al always having this particular intron with it so there will be always a split right this particular read over here that you see might be belonging to this area and this area because this black area will not be there or intron read will not be there so this is a major challenge for us to during the assembly stage now this assembly part also right there could be two different approaches one is that you do something called de novo assembly de novo is nothing but you have no reference genome you are just using the short sequence reads you're going to find the overlaps and you're going to a uh, form a sequence okay this is this might be your dna sequence these are your reads and you're just finding out the overlapping sequences and from the start or from scratch you're actually creating the sequence of the dna unknown dna segment okay that is what is being told in a bit more detail over here so the first approach is de novo transcriptome assembly so there is no reference available so we need to create one okay it's a difficult task because if there are repeated repeats in your uh, transcripts then it is going to be very difficult to map it right you will not know where to place a particular repeat so for this particular de novo transcriptome assembly you need to have longer reads you need to have higher coverage and you need to carry out paired in sequencing we have already discussed that okay and the approaches that you could be using is overlap layout consensus or de bronze graph okay now examples of graph based assembly softwares are velvet oasis transabis and trinity okay now let us briefly look into what is this olc and de bronze graph okay in overlap layout consensus or in short form olc these three steps are carried out overlap layout and consensus basically okay so in the first step overlapping pairs of reads are detected softwares will detect where the overlapping is happening those uh, reads will be detected second the graph is constructed and an appropriate ordering and orientation or layout of the reads are found so using those overlap a particular graph is constructed okay and using those graphs you will find out a layout what could be the possible layout of this complete genome 
okay finally a consensus sequence is computed from the ordered and oriented reads so finally you get a consensus sequence okay that is a final product i'll show it to you with a diagram so the olc paradigm which represents each read as a node and connects the nodes if they overlap so you can see over here these are your reads you find your software finds out where the overlapping sequences are for example between this and this this particular area is overlapping between this sequence and this sequence, this is overlapping. So uh, once you find overlapping reads, you will lay them out or you will form a graph. And this is the layout. After the layout has been formed, you get the complete sequence from here to here. That is a consensus sequence. Okay. So it will look something like this. This might be your read one. This might be your read two, read three, four, five, six, like that. So many reads are there, right? This region over here, this green is overlapping with green over here. So you have an idea that after this read, this read could be coming. And this is the overlapping region. So in the graph, you place it like this. Each read is treated as a, each read, for example, this is a read, right? This is treated as a node. And you connect these nodes if there is any overlap. So if this read is a node, if this read is a node, since there's an overlap, this can be connected with this. Okay. And finally, a consensus sequence is drawn by considering all the possibilities. So that is overlap layout consensus. This is in a very raw format that I have explained. Okay. So the next approach is de Bron graphs. Okay. So in this type of assembly, each read is broken into a sequence of overlapping k -mers. Okay. The distinct k are added as vertices to the graph and k that originate from adjacent positions in a read are linked by an edge. The assembly problem can then be formulated as finding a walk through the graph that visits each edge in the graph once. I will explain it with a diagram. Okay, so basically in De Bruyne's graph, what you're going to do is you have your reads, right? You have your reads, you're going to break it down into smaller pieces. And how long those pieces are denotes that K. For example, this is your read one. You can see G, C, T, T over here, right? This is your read two. Okay, for example, you're taking your K as four. That means you're breaking down your sequence into lengths of four. So if you break down this particular read, what will you get? If your K is four, your first uh, fragment will be G, C, T, T. Second fragment will be C, T, 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 right? That is what is being shown over here. Next read will be T, 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 A. Likewise, it'll go on. Same way, your read two will also be broken down into K mers. Okay, so you will have your first read, uh, first fragment as A, T, C, G, next one as T, C, G, G, next one as C, G, G, T. So that is what is being shown over here till the end. These will be the fragments that you have. What will you do after that? A software will then find out, is there any overlap or is there any similarity between the two reads? So anywhere between the K-mers, okay, it will find out, it will try to align different reads. Now, this is an example just with two reads, there will be multiple reads and this is done simultaneously, okay. So if you look over here, ATCG, TCGG is the last two fragments over here, the same fragments ATCG and TCGG. So if you consider this as one node and this as one node, the software will immediately know that this particular read two could be following read one. This is the overlapping sequence over here. Okay. So it will connect the vertices with, an, with edges and a graph is formed. And you actually understand this could be the overlapping sequence and you can, un, you can place read two after read one. Okay. This is a very crude way to make you understand what is De Bruyne graph approach. Okay. So this approach has significant computational advantage when compared with overlap based assembly strategies. Why? Why is it better than OLC? Because it does not require finding overlaps between pairs of reads and therefore does not require expensive dynamic programming procedures to identify such overlaps. So right now you'll be thinking, I just talked about overlaps and I'm saying over here that there is no need to find overlaps, right? Actually, instead, the overlaps between reads is implicit in the structure of the graph. That means in OLC, you are having a separate software to actually go and find where the overlaps are, right? But in De Bruyne's approach, right, while you create the k itself, the uh, overlaps are implicit in it. It's just inclusive in it. So you do not need to have a separate software to actually go and determine the overlaps. It is just done simultaneously by the, while the graph is being made. Okay, so that saves time, that saves cost. 
So that was de novo transcriptome assembly. That means you'd, you're trying to assemble this complete sequence from the scratch. Another approach could be reference-based transcriptome assembly. That means you already have a reference and then you're going to uh, assemble your transcriptome based on that. Okay. So in that, what you do is you have your DNA sequence, you have your reads, you will try to align it or map it to a reference sequence. Okay, so this is a much easier approach because you already have a reference and some areas might be unknown to you, but a major crude map of your DNA segment might could be formed with the help of a reference genome, okay, or a reference sequence. Now under this reference itself, you can to use two types of reference especially in RNA-seq, right? One could be a reference genome. Another could be a reference transcriptome, okay? So let's just go a bit deep into both of them. If you're aligning it to your genome or your chromosome, there'll be exon one, then there'll be an intron, then exon two and an intron, then exon three like that. So your read one over here is within the exon, but read two over here is split, right? You can see over here. There's an intron that will come over here. That means this read belongs to this area. This, uh, the rest of the read belongs over here. And this particular area is belonging to exon three. So you need to find out whether it is spanning your exon exon region. So when you're aligning to a reference genome, you need an alignment tool that can allow for read to be split between distant regions of reference in the events that the read spans two exons. So typically the intron exon annotations are available in a GFF3 file or GTF file. So all these annotations, you know, they're available in this file format. So these files are usually available for download at the same location that you obtained your reference genome. So when you're selecting your uh, reference genome, right, along with that, in the database itself, you will have your intron exon annotations for that particular genome available. So you'll be downloading that too. So including intron exon annotation with your RNA-seq alignment will significantly improve the quality of the alignments. Okay. So the next uh, approach in reference base could be aligning to a reference transcriptome. Transcriptome is nothing but your mRNA, right? It will not have any introns in it. So when you are aligning it over here, it will be much easier. Read one will be aligning to say exon one, read two to the exon two. Okay. And there'll be portions which are spanning the exon exon split junctions also. So while mapping reads to a transcriptome, intron exon boundaries are irrelevant, correct? Now there are two basic strategies that you can use for transcriptome assembly. One is you assemble a single longest gene model for each set of splice, splice variants. Now we'll be seeing what splice variants are okay in the coming slides and why it should be worry about that. And another approach could be we will try to reconstruct each variant separately. So this approach is limited to known transcript and it is very heavily dependent on the annotation part. So what is this alternative splicing, right? So RNA splicing is integral to eukaryotes and contributes significantly to protein regulation and diversity occurring in more than 90% of human genes. There are multiple alternative splicing modes, exon skipping being the most common among the splicing modes that occurs in humans and higher eukaryotes. So if you look over here, these blocks over here represent your exons these lines over here represent your introns okay now while post transcriptional modification when you get your matured mrna you can have something called exon skipping that means this particular exon is skipped you have these two exons joined together or you can have just these two joined together and this one is skipped in your mrna so there are different types of splicing events that could occur and this would give rise to alternative splicing so all this we have to consider while we are carrying out the alignment or assembly of a transcriptome. Okay. So one of the goals of RNA-seq is to identify these alternative splicing events and test if they differ between the conditions. So long read sequencing is a good approach as it captures the full transcript and thus minimizes many issues of estimating the isoform abundance. So the most popular RNA-seq alignment programs, for example, STAR, Top Hat, GSNAP, use the entire genome as a reference and existing gene annotation as a guide for where to expect large gaps. Now, when we are trying to do reference-based transcriptome assembly, right, you're going to use certain sequence aligners. Now, these aligners must not be too strict and neither should be too lenient. What am I trying to say? If you're trying to match it too strictly that uh, nucleotide by nucleotide, every nucleotide has to match. That means what your read will not or your sequence will not match to your reference genome anywhere. This is just a reference genome that we are using. The, the one that you have sequenced newly is an 
is another sequence, right? So the uh, matching might be very less. So you will not find an alignment at all. Neither should the uh, matching be too lenient that you're leaving out large portions. It will give us a wrong idea about what actually the gene represents. So a fine balance has, be, has to be used by sequence aligners when they're trying to match between a uh, reference genome and a newly se sequenced genome. Okay. So otherwise, a large proportion of sequencing reads will not be assigned to a particular feature in the reference. So popular aligners include Bowtie 2, BWA men, and GSNAP. Okay. Now, in Illumina sequencing, the output is generally short reads. And the aligners that are aligning these short reads, they give out the data commonly in the form of SAM files or BAM files. Okay. So the BAM file is nothing but the compressed binary equivalent of SAM files. So these files should contain all of the information you need for downstream analysis, such as annotation, transcript abundance, comparisons, and polymorphism detection. After this assembly part, after this aligning part, what do you do with this data that you have? The simplest but most powerful use of RNA-seq is finding differences in gene expression between two or more conditions, that is between treated versus non-treated. This process is called differential expression. So the outputs are frequently referred to as differentially expressed genes or DEGs, and these genes can either be up or down regulated. That means it could be having a higher expression or a lower expression. Okay. So if in case you have a doubt about what is differential gene expression, please do refer to the part one of this series where I have discussed the same. Okay. So there are many tools that perform differential expression. Most are run in R, Python, or the Unix command line. Commonly used tools include DEseq, Edge R, and Woom plus Lima, all of which are available through R Bioconductor. This is a software for analysis of genomic data. Okay. So what happens over there is you have a sample one, sample two, you take carry out mRNA isolation, you uh, do all the cDNA library preparation, you go with the adapter ligation, then you go for Illumina sequencing. So you take your sample one and sample two, then you're going to do the sequence alignment. That is what we saw today, right? And it could be done against the reference genome. Now, while you're doing that, what you see over here is in sample one, gene A has been expressed so many times, gene B has been expressed so many times. The same genes in sample two have been underexpressed. Okay, so you will generate all the sequence counts for all genes in the genome. So if you look at gene A, compare it between sample one and sample two. If 30 is the count that you have got for gene A in sample one, and 10 is the count that you have got in gene, for gene A in sample two, the difference is 30 by 10. That is, there's a three-fold change that has occurred between sample one and sample two. For gene B, it's a two-fold change. So that is how you can understand the change that has occurred between uh, two different samples. Okay, this is, uh, this is how, in a very simple way, how differential expression studies are carried out. Now to summarize, what did we do in RNA-seq? You had your tissue, you isolated the total RNA, you took the, uh, you assessed the RNA quality, you did DNA treatment and enriched whichever species you're going to work with. Then you went for RNA fragmentation, where which would be done enzymatically or by sonication. Then you did your cDNA synthesis. After cDNA synthesis, you repaired your uh, ends or you did end polishing, you ligated your adapters, then you do the selection of the ligated DNA. After that, you went for amplification, wherein you attach your DNA to the flow cell, you perform bridge amplification, you generate clusters, and the next step, you anneal the sequencing primer. After that, you go for the actual sequencing. So in the uh, sequencing part, you add one particular nucleotide, that is the fluorophore and that is captured. Then you unblock it, you remove the fluorophore, next nucleotide comes and adds, and so on and so forth. Each image is captured and you get a sequencing done. So after this, you can use this data either for transcriptome assembly, gene expression studies, or to identify novel transcripts. If you're going for transcriptome assembly, you need to have greater sequencing depth. You need to use longer reads, nearly 150 nucleotides in length. You, and you need to also use paired end sequencing there. If you're going for gene expression studies, you can just use single end sequencing and 75 nucleotide read length is enough. That means short reads are enough for doing comparative studies. If you're going for to identify novel transcripts, you need greater sequencing depth again, and you need to use paired and sequencing. Only then you'll be understanding the alternative splicings that have occurred and different isoforms of RNA that have been there. Okay, that is the end of major RNA seq procedure. Now let us just have a peek into what is this direct RNA sequencing and single set RNA sequencing. These are the techniques which are currently being developed. Okay, so the 
Direct RNA sequencing platform offered by Oxford Nanopore Technologies allows for direct measurement of RNA molecules without the need of conversion to complementary DNA, fragmentation or amplification. So that is direct RNA sequencing. In the RNA-seq procedure that we learned, we are con tra reverse transcribing mRNA into cDNA and that was being sequenced, right? But when you use direct RNA sequencing, you do not have to go for that conversion. You can directly sequence your mRNA in uh, your sequencing platform and that is being offered by Oxford Nanopore Technologies, okay? So as such, it is virtually capable of detecting any given RNA modification present in the molecule that is being sequenced, as well as provide poly A tail length estimations at the level of individual RNA molecules. So the initial information about the mRNA is actually retained, okay, because you're not converting into cDNA and you're not carrying out further modifications in it, right? Their master of post workflow, it performs both data pre-processing, that is base calling, quality control, demultiplexing, filtering, mapping, estimation of per gene or per transcript abundances, and data analysis, prediction of RNA modifications, and estimation of poly A tail lengths. Everything is done. Okay, their workflow called Master of Post, it has everything inclusive. So that is about direct RNA sequencing, just to peek into it, okay? I have not discussed in, it in detail over here. Now let us look at what is single cell RNA sequencing. Single cell RNA sequencing or SCRNA-seq provides the expression profiles of individual cells and is considered the gold standard for defining cell states and phenotypes as of 2020. This can uncover the existence of rare cell types within a cell population that may never have been seen before. So what is happening in uh, normal mRNA-seq, you have a sample and th that sample is from uh, a tissue which contains numerous cells, right? So that sample might be from a lot of cells together. But here what we do is we take the mRNA from just one single cell and we are trying to find out the differences within cells, okay, of the same tissue maybe, okay. For example, rare specialized cells in the lung, pulmonary inocytes that express the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator were identified in 2018 by two groups performing single cell RNA-seq on lung airway epithelia. Okay, so this is an example where uh, conducting a single cell RNA sequencing actually uh, helped us in understanding that there were specialized cells within your lung cells. When we talk about lung cells, we're just saying lung cells, right? Together as a cumulative. But when you study individual cells, that is what we can come to know, okay? So RNA-seq is the first sequencing-based method that allows the entire transcriptome to be surveyed in a very high throughput and quantitative manner. So with that, we come to the end of the session on RNA-seq. It was a long session spanned across four different videos. I hope you got something out of this and I hope it helps you to understand your coursework in much more a better way. And as always, as the session ends, I do have a motivational quote for you. The one for today is, let your smile change the world. Do not let the world change your smile. With that, I will end. If you like this video, if you found anything useful about it, please do let me know in the comment section. Please do not forget to subscribe to my channel and please do share it with your friends and colleagues. It will be a great help for me to grow my channel. Thank you so much for visiting. I'm hoping that through my channel, learning can become a happy process for you. So until next time, keep smiling. Bye-bye.